Uh, I want to introduce to you three guests, and uh, we're very excited to have uh, with us uh, today. Um, uh, first, uh, Dylan Avery, an acclaimed filmmaker with numerous documentaries, short films, music videos to his credit. His film on police brutality, Black and Blue, won the best documentary at the Catalina Film Festival. He also made Magic Molecule, a documentary on CBD. He edited and co-produced The Professional, a Stevie Blatt story, a documentary that premiered at Slam Dance in 2019. And last but not least, Dylan's a creator of the most viewed online 9-11 documentary ever, Loose Change 9-11. How many of you have heard about it and had to have your have had your mind turned around or your life turned upside down, depending on what happens? Uh, that was incredible. We'll be talking about that. Uh, Kelly David is here with us also. I'll bring them all up in a moment. She has a bachelor's uh, of science degree from New York Institute of Technology in 2002. She majored in behavioral science and minored in criminal justice. Kelly helped organize the day-to-day -day operations of several businesses in New York, where she grew up and volunteered in the 9-11 Truth movement. She then joined architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. Her remarkable management skills later in 2014 as chief operating officer. We got her promoted and she's doing a fantastic job. The following year, she was named to the board of directors here at AE911 Truth. She's absolutely indispensable to me personally, to us as an organization. Finally, I want you to meet the star of the film that we're going to be talking about today, the author of the four-year finite element analysis computer modeling at the University of Alaska. Professor Leroy Halsey, PhD, PE, SE, structural engineer. He was the chair of the civil and engineering department at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks until his retirement in May. During his 50-year career, Dr. Halsey taught at the University of Missouri in Rolla, North Carolina State University and at UAF. He served in the American Society of Civil Engineers, the American Council of Engineering Companies in 2020 with funding from us. He, he did complete that four-year computer modeling study, which is changing the landscape in the academic and uh, institutional uh, careers and uh, uh, fields in engineering. Uh, and uh, we're getting this out. We've sent 75,000 postcards to engineers all across the country. We've, we're sending 400 copies of this 135 page report, which by the way, you can download at our website. Don't let me forget to tell you that it's free. Uh, that um, PDF, it's right on our website. Uh, you can find it. Uh, let me bring up our esteemed guests at this time. Uh, first, uh, Dylan Avery and hello, Dylan. Hello, Richard. Hey, and also Kelly David, our Chief Operating Officer, and Professor Leroy Halsey. Uh, gentlemen and ladies, how are you all? Great. I'm good. great. <laughs> you look good. Thanks. All right. Now, I'm going to do this, guys. I I'm going to put uh, uh, Professor Halsey on hold uh, just for a moment. And we're going to focus. In fact, Dylan, do you mind if I put you on hold for just a moment, too? I don't mind. We, Kelly and I've got something very special. And um, uh, Dylan Avery uh, has been in the 9-11 truth movement longer than I think about anybody. And before we get started with the movie seven, Kelly and I wanted to take a special moment to recognize somebody whose work has enacted a sea change of awakening to the 9-11 truth. He and his team created the original film series, which has been seen tens of millions of times, waking the very dead in the process. Yes, we're talking about Loose Change 9-11. And yes, we're talking about an original 18-year-old hero in the 9-11 Truth Movement 19 years ago. He was a teenager when he asked himself this, when he, when he tasked himself with this monumental achievement. What were you doing as a teenager? Our viewers, if you were like me, you weren't creating a film that changed the world. Take a look at some of this vintage footage of this brave man. 
Let's go from the beginning then, and just to ask you first of all, why did you start to think that there was more to 9-11 to than met the eye? I just stumbled into it. It's really what it came down to. I started researching 9-11, I started looking into the essence, I started looking into what happened in the Twin Towers. And uh, it was just a domino effect from there. Bill of Let's Roll 911.org, he started advertising it and started you know, getting the word out. I put up a couple trailers, you know, I was hitting up the forums, you know, you know, my presence was out there, but I mean, people were just kind of like, yeah, well, I'll check it out, and I put up a couple things here and there, so I mean, basically, it was word of mouth. Loose Change is a video produced on a laptop, and yet it's ranked among the most watched independent videos since it was put online last year. And you suggested we show a part of a, a clip of the documentary Loose Change mm -hmm. by Dylan Avery. And that was a film that has been watched by 10 million viewers because wow. you could see it uh, through the internet. What they say, um, it's the things that, you know, um, make you look at what you thought you saw in a different light. As we take on the issue of what happened on September 11, 2001, our guests are Dylan Avery, writer and director of Loose Change. At 5.20 p.m. on September 11th, uh, World Trade Center Building 7 it was a 47-story steel frame skyscraper 300 feet to the north of the North Tower. Uh, at 5.20 p.m., this building collapses in under seven seconds. Kelly, let's talk about this just a little bit. You and me. Um, hold on one second. Uh, I, I got to I gotta think about this. Uh, Dylan, um, on behalf of all of us in the 9-11 Truth Movement, from the bottom of our hearts, we thank you collectively for lifting the veil from our minds. Folks at home, if you have a loose change story that you'd like to share with Dylan, you know somebody who just got literally woken up or dragged through the mud with it. <laughs> Some of us had to experience our own internal world view turned upside down. I invite you to email it to Dylan to us through us info at ae911truth.org. We'll send it on to him. Be sure to express your appreciation. Dylan, uh, let me bring you on for a moment. Um, hold on one second. Let's bring in Dylan. And, and folks, uh, a huge round of applause for Dylan. <laughs> Gosh, oh, that, was, uh, stop. that was incredible. I've got a question for you, though. Here we go. Was it What was it that really inspired you to create this extraordinary film series and put in all that work? as a teenager. Please tell us a story of how this happened. Uh, kind of slowly and gradually. I mean, it, it was one of those things where, you know, it's not like on September 12th, I was working on it. You know, it was definitely a, a slow discovery process of looking into the, the, the slow disbursement of information that was starting to come out in 2002, 2003. Um, the same slow disbursement of video footage. Um, you know, things that we weren't really able to see that day on the TV or things that were aired once and weren't really shown again. Um, yeah, it was just kind of a slow discovery process. And it all started with the military's response or lack there of uh, to the uh, to the attacks themselves. And it just kind of like spider webbed out from there. Kelly, you surely must have a, a question for Dylan here. A question? No, I don't really have a question. <laughs> um, no, though I would like to you know, make some comments because I, I do believe that loose change has had an enormous effect in helping to create the 9-11 truth movement. When I ask most people what it was about the 9-11 evidence that woke them up, more than anything else, I always hear, oh, I watched loose change or someone recommended that I watch loose change. And uh, I feel like most of us wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for that powerful film that a young aspiring filmmaker made on his laptop. 
as a kid, basically. And um, and to quote Vanity Fair, you know, I think they put it best when they called it the first internet blockbuster because it was just that. And you know, as the, as the years have passed, he's become an acclaimed filmmaker. You've mentioned the films that he has done, so he's just you know branched out, gotten a lot better since then. But more than anything else, um, I have to say, from my experience, it's been a pleasure and an honor to have worked with him. I, I found him to be such a driven, hard worker whose abilities that I, I deeply admire. On set, he's completely focused from start to finish, always on top of every aspect, making sure that each piece goes off without a hitch. But to me, Dylan is just a wonderful human being with a huge heart. And over the years, I've been lucky enough to have the privilege of calling him a very dear friend, a friend who I can always count on to brighten my hectic day, making me smile just by shooting me over a text or something like that. So Dylan, we all owe you a great thanks. And for me personally, thank you. Oh, thank you, Kelly. That's so sweet. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you, Dylan. I'm going to turn it back to you guys. Let's talk about this new film, Seven. Sure. Yeah, uh, I guess that's on me. Um, yeah, what was it? Uh, I think October of last year, Kelly, you guys had reached out and said, you know, we're wrapping up this study and we want to have a, an accompanying documentary for it, something people can watch to kind of distill down the findings. Um, and, you know, for me, I hadn't made a 9-11 film in a decade uh, and I didn't really have any interest in doing it just because I felt like I had already done everything that I could have possibly done and maybe a little bit more. Um, so the nice thing about this project is it was a new approach to, I don't want to say old material, but, you know, it was it was a new way of looking at the subject and looking at a very specific aspect of 9-11 instead of trying to distill the whole big picture down to one single film. Um, so to me, that was the most exciting part. You know, I got to hire my favorite DP, um, you know, a director of photography, for anyone who doesn't know what that means. Um, I got to hire a director of photography. I got to hire a sound man, two people that I know from Los Angeles that are just amazing at what they do. Um, and it was just a nice opportunity to revisit the subject and to do it through uh, a different lens, uh, both literally and figuratively. Yeah. How, how about you, Kelly? How, yeah. how, how was your time on the set? I thought it was great. Um, everything about it was amazing. I think, you know, on top of all the hard work that we did and organizing everything to make sure that this film was different than your average 9-11 documentary I mean, and hiring the director of photography, I think that went a long way into changing it from what you would normally see in a 9-11 documentary to something more you would see more cinematic, something you would see on Netflix. Um, and I think, you know, on on the set, traveling to Alaska, getting to work with Leroy directly, getting to know him, getting to see him interact with his students. Um, it was a wonderful experience. And, you know, honestly, we had a lot of fun doing it. <laughs> I think it was great. I would agree. <laughs> yeah. So we have um, some clips to show. We have a new trailer uh, that we haven't released yet. Um, I don't know who's going to queue those up. I'm guessing. I, th I think that's on Richard. I think but... that's on Richard. Yeah. So I think we should show the trailer first, and then we have two clips on top of that. We should show the trailer, and then maybe we should bring in Leroy and have Leroy talk a bit. But, yeah. uh, you know, I'm not running the show here. That's just yeah. my suggestion. <laughs> and I'm fine with that. All right. Well, then let's get to it. I, I've, I'm going to show all the clips, if that's okay with you guys, uh, and then we'll bring on Leroy, because uh, that's the uh, order of events as I have them uh, in my uh, show here. So here's the here's the uh, the, the trailer for for the uh, the new movie. And uh, did you say when it comes out, Dylan? I had a distraction there. No, I mean we're we're waiting to get a final release date from 1091, but that's really the big excitement, the big announcement, one of several to make today is that you know we've partnered with 1091 Media for this project, so it's going to get some legitimate distribution through traditional uh, channels. So that's nice. Yeah, that's fantastic. Did you talk about the traditional channels before I forget to ask you that too? No, I mean there's there's no specifics yet, but I mean I imagine it'll pop up on iTunes and Google Play and you know they might they they did mention streaming platforms. I don't know if that's going to include Netflix just because it's Netflix, but um 
we did shoot it in 4K, so we do have that going for us. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Here we go. It's been a point of controversy now for more than a decade. A researcher now from the University of Alaska Fairbanks is weighing in. My name is Leroy Halsey, that's my middle name, and I'm a structural engineering professor here at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. He led a four-year study which reevaluates whether Building 7's collapse could have been caused by fire. Building 7 of the World Trade Center came down. It was never hit by an airplane. It fell because thermal expansion caused a fire-induced progressive collapse. And we'd never experienced, prior to that day, a steel frame building collapsing due to fire. It just didn't happen. Was there a possibility it could lead up to failure through these fundamentals that NIST looked at and said they could, I looked at and said they could. The way they modeled it was somewhat pushing the limit, putting it mildly. NIST said it was a fire problem, but yet I did not see any change to our codes. I mean, I think the work that we're doing is ultimately gonna make the difference. I have that confidence, because I, I know the truth always comes out. If there's a problem with the collapse of Building 7, there's a problem with 9-11. This stated that a primary load-bearing girder attached to column 79 became dislodged from its column connections, causing a series of failures through columns 80 and 81, bringing the entire building down. According to NIST, even without the initial structural damage caused by debris impact from the collapse of WTC-1, WTC-7 would have collapsed from fires having the same characteristics as those experienced on September 11, 2001. Conspicuously absent from NIST's report is the corroded piece of steel from Building 7. Despite FEMA having identified it as a key piece of evidence, the extreme temperatures responsible for the corrosive attack on the steel were magnitudes higher than the maximum temperatures estimated by NIST to have occurred inside Building 7. The New York Times referred to that piece of steel as perhaps the deepest mystery uncovered in the investigation. Uh, there's, there's a reference often made to a piece of steel from Building 7 but there was no evidence that any of the residue in that steel, in that piece of steel, uh, had any uh, relationship to uh, uh, an, an, an undue uh, fire event in the building or any other kind of incendiary device in the building. They seemed to focus on a solution right from the very beginning and ignore all evidence that would have led them in any other direction. So that's a, that's. Bass backwards, as they say. My concern about the NIST reports is they ignored evidence, and it wasn't because they didn't know about it. And I see that sometimes in, in engineering, in the business, where, where your boss would tell you, focus on this. The way they modeled it was somewhat pushing the limit, putting it mildly. They got to a point where they did, uh, NIST did a, a beautiful animation of the, of the building, which looks like, and I keep repeating the same thing, it looks like it's crumpling like a beer can, as opposed to basically falling straight into its footprint. I never worked for NIST, but I was a uh, uh, resident engineer for the Army Corps of Engineers for a few years. I, am, I have a uh, very strong feeling about the responsibilities of what engineers have in general, in particular, 
engineers that work for the government. They have a higher responsibility in some ways, or they should feel that way. I did. There was just this silence in the, uh, in the academic world about this subject. So we began looking around for someone that would be willing to undertake such a study. And fortunately, through a series of personal uh, acquaintances, we ran across Professor Halsey up at the University of Alaska at Fairbanks. He's a straight arrow type of, type of person. He, doesn't, he wants to look at things from a very rational, uh, impartial perspective blocking all the noise out, which is really what is needed in this case. Any quick comments before you bring uh, Leroy in? Yeah, uh, that was a scene that, you know, is kind of half Ed Astor, uh, kind of giving a little bit of an Act One uh, history lesson on Building 7, and then, you know, it was followed up by the comments by Roland, Scott, and Kamal, who are the other three engineers featured in it. So, you know, it's just some introductory stuff, warming up the audience that may not be aware of everything about Building 7. So I say we bring in Leroy. Well, there he is. Leroy, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Great, great, great. Um, you are the star of this show. Can, can we uh, turn it over to you and tell us uh, what was it like to, to create a study of the collapse of Building 7 and, and challenge the preeminent authority on the collapse of Building 7, in this case, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, who was tasked by Congress to explain this collapse to the American people. And here you come along finally. How did you get into this? And when, what was your experience like over the last four years and then making the film? I want to give you the floor here. Well, I guess I was approached um, by your people, uh, a gentleman, John Thay, who's uh, in Anchorage, and he contacted me. I turned it down with the idea that, you know, I just... Uh, um, wasn't sure that I wanted to do that. Um, he then approached me again. I turned it down. And then on the third time, I said, okay, I think I need to do this. So it, with that being said, uh, I put together several criteria. One of those is that um, it, would, it would be based purely on science. It would not in involve uh, any of the hearsays or any of the other things that would be out there. Uh, this was a, a science study, basically, uh, that simple. I recruited two PhD students to do this with me, and we set up a, a, a quality control method by which we could examine the valid, the values, and the and the study on a daily basis, so that we could be sure that what we were doing, we all ag could agree to, or we we would uh, question the work that was being done on a daily basis to make sure that what we were given, uh, putting out there was gonna be scientifically sound. So so that being said, I put together uh, the requirement of having two, two finite element programs. One is SAP 2000, which is well known, and the other is Abacus, which is a basically a research tool and it's very, very powerful. And then we used a, a, a couple other programs to help us along the way. Uh, and then through that process, uh, we uh, obtained uh, the er erection drawings. We uh, re, uh, it, it got a lot of additional information technically uh, that was uh, available through uh, that NIST had available, and we were able to recover get a lot of that. Unfortunately, uh, as you all may know, that um, the debris, which would have been the most important part of this whole study if we could have gotten it, uh, was sent out very quickly, very unusual. Uh, if Typically, if you're going to do a forensic study, you're going to have that information available and you can begin to sort through and evaluate the debris and evaluate the conditions that may have produced that debris. We didn't have that. So we had to return to the structural, the structure itself, examine the the, the potential energy being imposed by the fires uh, that were uh, argued to be the cause of the failure. And then through that process, we went ahead and began to look at uh, the response of the structure. And, and so we did it uh, individually right from the beginning without regards to what NIST did. Then later, uh, we pursued looking at the NIST study and uh, and began to look at whether we could agree with what was going had gone on there uh, and their results are if we uh, were unable to verify what was found and so so through that process this is where we 
where we went. And so, it, unfortunately, it took a, a, about four years to get it done. Uh, the last year almost exclusively was spent trying to uh, determine the mechanisms that actually contributed or, or, or resulted in what you see uh, in the videos of how it, that structure came down. And we were able to simulate that fairly well. And, and please understand, we did not do a video game with this. We actually ran it on the computer to examine whether the conditions that we were getting simulated what the actual structure uh, experienced during that failure day. Thank you, Leroy. Um, I know that um, we must have some questions for you. And, and while I'm looking for those from our good friend, um, we, uh, we want to uh, ask you, uh, well, Dylan and, and, and Kelly, I mean, what, what was it like working with Leroy on the set? Can you give us a behind the scenes uh, feel of this operation. This, this is going to be a sea change too, because we, we did this film to get the attention, not only of the public, but the engineers, uh, who, you know, to grab them. So um, uh, what was it like working with Leroy, Kelly, Dylan? Um, well, I, Kelly and I can probably both speak to this, but you know, I had filmed uh, Leroy speaking uh, in, at Berkeley at the faculty club in September of 2019. But you know, apart from filming his speech in you know, some very brief interactions with him, I didn't really get to know him per se, but after spending some time with him in Fairbanks and just watching him uh, walk around the campus and interact with students and just kind of the general respect that I saw for him around the campus. Um, it was nice. Like I, I felt like when I filmed his uh, presentation, I, you know, kind of got to know Professor Leroy Halsey. But then after my time in Fairbanks with him, I felt like I had met just Halsey. So. Yeah, that's what his students call him. <laughs> and that was one of the things that really impressed me. His students just adore him. And he takes time away from his normal schedule to go in and check on them when they're in, you know, just a regular conference room working on their final project. Cause it was around finals when we were up there and he just goes in to talk to them and give them advice and they love him. They, they all call him Holsley. That that's his name. You know, he's, he's not the professor. He, he's almost like a friend. And, um, you know, just from my own experience, dealing with professors, when you get a professor that's like that and they're they're able to keep your attention, grab your attention, build a good relationship with you, that's when you learn the most. And I just think in being there, working with him, A, I got to know him a lot better and realized that he was even a you know, great, better person than I thought he was before, but B, to, to see what an amazing professor he actually is. So I was really impressed with that. And yeah, it was, um, as I mentioned earlier, it, it was great. It was fun and to be behind the scenes and get to see all of that and get to know Leroy better. Okay, and Le Leroy, on a technical note, one of our viewers says, uh, NIST won't release their computer uh, input data for building seven. Uh, did that cause any issues with your computer modeling efforts? Uh, no, not really. I mean, uh, we we had their results and their conclusions. Uh, we we modeled and tried to simulate uh, their their findings. We had enough information to be able to make a determination for the most part of what they were doing, and so I wasn't uh, too concerned about that. It was it was clear that there was uh, there there were errors in their modeling. Uh, unfortunately, and that led them to the conclusions they had. Uh, and so if you recall my first presentation, I think it was in, may have been in, uh, uh, on the 15th anniversary, I don't remember. Uh, but uh, that's when I pointed out that the building actually moved in the opposite direction uh, thermally that to what they had said. And so that was a big, big uh, observation right away, that there was things that were different that uh, the building had to go through to actually do what it needed to do during that condition, based upon the, what, the limited amount of fires that was in the building. 
So okay, and it did did you have to uh, convince uh, the university at all? Was there any trouble working with the university? Any harsh feedback? Any effort to control the outcome of this project? Let me just say this: that uh, I'm I'm I was very 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 pleased with the, our university. They stepped out. They wanted to make sure that the science was good, and they, you know, patted me on the back for what I was doing. Uh, keep in mind that uh, the presentation, the two presentations at the university, was actually introduced by our vice president of research, uh, uh, vice president or vice chancellor. I can't remember which, but anyway, uh, he was he was just uh, really uh, complimentary on our work and. I'm pleased to say that it's, it was a great experience to be able to do that without feeling any pressure. Uh, one of our university professors in the journalism department actually early on did some filming there as well as part of this study to show that how we were actually putting together the uh, quality control mechanism for doing the work that we were doing. So. Okay. Thanks. And uh, for Dylan, uh, did working on Loose Change influence the kind of films that you chose to work on later? No, not really. I wish I had a more exciting answer for you, but um, <laughs> I don't know. Like I'm always, I'm always rubbed the wrong way by injustices of one form and another. And it's funny because I started making my police brutality documentary in February of 2014, which is six months before the uprising in Ferguson. Uh, so I definitely had my finger on the pulse with that one. And then of course I was kind of unfortunately beat to the punch by a whole bunch of other productions that got off the ground shortly after Ferguson and then wrapped up shortly thereafter. Um, but, uh, I don't know. I, I try to make films that speak to societal ills in one way or another. And even with the narrative feature that I just finished directing, like it's, you know, there's a lot of themes in there about, you know, things that people can relate to is all I will say. But, um, I don't know. I guess I try to somewhat make the world a better place through my movies. Some people might disagree with that, but that's what I find to be motivating. Cool. Uh, how are we able, this viewer says, in the near future to get this film seven to be presented in other countries like the most happy and least corrupted country in the world, Finland, <laughs> and then Europe in general? Oh, I thought they were going to say Costa Rica. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, 10, 1091 is an international distribution company. So I would imagine that uh, internationals actually might be uh, more interesting. Uh, I can't think of the word. Uh, platform isn't the word, but uh, territory. Yeah, I think international territories might be good for this project. Um, you know, and then one of, one of the other reasons that was... Um, it was beneficial that 1091 approached us about the project because, I mean, my private screener uploads of the film are getting removed by YouTube, even though they're not public and there's no way for anyone to see them except for myself and the people I send it to. My private uploads of seven for you guys to watch are getting removed by YouTube. So that's fun. <laughs> so so thankfully, we have it in the hands of a, of a legitimate distribution company that can get it out there, can get it past uh, some of the censorship that's happening. Um, yeah, you know, so we'll see. But um, yeah, we we're, were handing the masters off to them. They've got the artwork. They've got a lot of the things that they need to start marketing it. We're supposed to get our sales sheet to them soon. Um, so once they start gauging the interest and in seeing where they can get it out to, um, kind of go from there. But I imagine it'll come out shortly after the election uh, just because that's basically the only thing that's going to be on people's mind. I mean, it's already the 12th and I feel like people are forgetting about 9-11. Uh, so I hope, my hope is that after the election, one way or another, people will be ready to focus on something that isn't the election. Uh, so we'll see. And it'll give them enough time to market it. And uh, that was an another, you know, good thing about teaming up with 1090 when they did mention international, uh, platforms that right. are available. So, you know, that, that opportunity is definitely there. Awesome. Well, um, Dylan, this viewer wants to know how hard was it to make uh, Seven? Uh, did making a documentary about building Seven make it any harder to get cooperation that you always need to make a movie? 
Um, there wasn't really a lot of cooperation needed um, just because, you know, we already had the interviews lined up like uh, all the participants were willing. There was one eyewitness that we we're really banking on interviewing uh, that we were supposed to interview in February. And then he kind of stopped responding to us, uh, which is weird because he was very enthusiastic and had actually originally approached oh AE 9-11 uh, Truth about coming out in the first place. Uh, this is a person that's on the public record on the day of 9-11 discussing what he witnessed. And I was going back and forth with him. I talked to them on the phone a couple of times. And then when it came down to scheduling the interview, he just stopped responding. Uh, so that was a bit of a challenge um, only because, you know, we had this specific ending in mind for the documentary and had to go in a different direction. But that's documentary filmmaking for you. You always have to adapt and change according to what it is you actually capture. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. It was it was a double edged sword because for one, it was kind of refreshing to work on the subject material again, but also, you know, be having already made four films about the subject. You know, it was tricky sometimes to find the right approach for certain scenes and try to find a way to keep it interesting and exciting for myself. So I don't find myself getting burnt out the way I did a decade ago. Right. And um, here's a question uh, maybe all of us should tackle. Okay, we spent four years and a whole lot of supporters' dollars. I mean, a whole lot. More than I ever thought we could raise. This was beyond my wildest expect expectations. Uh, we really had some, some donors, uh, and I mean thousands of donors, come through to support this effort. Um, what are we going to do with it? <laughs> well, I mentioned earlier, uh, I think some couple of things I was aware of, uh, not aware of, but we, we had more supporters support the effort to get this out. One donor in particular said, I want this going to every major engineering association and major engineering firm in the country. So Larry in our office printed 400 of these and he's sending them out. He's halfway through that project right now. And we sent 75,000 postcards uh, to as many engineers as we could get uh, email addresses for. Addresses. What did I say? Email. We email. email At mailing addresses. Kelly, I told you she's on top of everything. <laughs> uh, Kelly, are you aware of any other efforts? Um, because I have some in my mind, like Congress, which we've gotten them to. Uh, many right. members of Congress. Uh, what other what other uh, efforts are, are we making that you're aware of? I mean, those, those are pretty much the things right now. And now we're just trying to work on, you know, what we can do. What's the next step? Um, you know, we've tossed around a couple of different ideas on how to get this out there, how to grab engineers' attention, like possibly YouTube ads. You know, all, all these things were discussed. Um, but there isn't anything that we have cemented down now at this moment. But um, this is not something that we're just going to let go. It's not like we did this study. We mailed out a bunch of postcards. We're making a movie and that's that. No. I mean, just the request for correction alone is just one step in the right direction for this. So, um, yeah, it was a four-year study. And it cost a lot of money. It was a lot of sacrifices for all of us. And... We thank all of our supporters for helping us out here because, as Richard said, he didn't even believe it would be possible to raise that amount of money, but we were able to do it and pull it off. So this won't be the end. We definitely will do everything that we can possibly do in order to get as many engineers to read this as possible. The key is, because it is such a long draft you know, re report itself, and even the draft report was long, uh, the report itself is long, and there's a lot of material. Um, so you got to try to grab their attention. And then um, after um, you know, we pique their interest, then they can go look uh, deeper into it. And so, um, yeah, we're coming up with a bunch of different things. And uh, as I said before, this is not it. You know, um, it's, it's not over. So, um, yeah, time will tell. Soon. And our Director of Strategy and Development, uh, Ted Walter. Um, I want to make sure everybody can hear me. Uh, yeah. Yeah, good. Um, we're, uh, he reminded us that, well, this whole film is about the study. This is the major effort, actually, that we have to get it out there. We want millions of people to see it. And we're going to send the film itself to every member of Congress 
to every large engineering firm and association. And not to mention the request for correction, which we covered in detail yesterday, 100 page request, which focuses on the results of this study, which completely pulls the rug out from underneath NIST's uh, initiation of collapse theory that this building came down due to normal office fires. Uh, Professor Halsey, did this building come down due to normal office fires? No. <laughs> and as they so famously asked you at our Justice in Focus conference, the attorneys whom you were testifying before, if you were to give a, a letter grade to NIST uh, on their final report of the World Trade Center 7 collapse, uh, what grade would you give them? Uh, you give students grades all the time. Uh, what would be NIST's grade for this project of theirs? Well, it wouldn't be good. <laughs> uh, probably a D or an F. <laughs> and why? Well, they had the wrong conclusions. They had the wrong, mo the model wasn't accurate. Uh, they uh, ignored things that were actually uh, used during construction that they said were not. I mean, there was a number of factors that were not uh, exactly what was supposed to be there. And so that led to conclusions that were inaccurate. Okay, then. Uh, one viewer says uh, to you, Professor Halsey, wants to know, did you model actual controlled demolitions to compare it to Building 7's collapse? I did not. What I did is I looked at the conditions that were necessary to bring it down, to look to uh, what we began to see in terms of velocities. We had a, a dynamic analysis that we were looking at and, and looking at uh, taking out the structural pieces that, that would give it the conditions that, that you actually see. And so through that process, we were able to uh, almost uh, duplicate uh, the uh, the velocity that was going down and and the parts of the structure that had to go down. That took us over a year, almost a year to get that that to happen, to show that uh, the other things that were being said could not actually have occurred. Okay, so there's one other uh, question here. Uh, Professor, did you simulate what the fall of World Trade Center 7 would have looked like under the failure that NIST insists happened, i.e. the slipping off of one end of a beam under the heat of a fire. We did. The, the building would have not come straight down. Didn't happen. Is there any credit you can give NIST at all? Well, I'm I'm not sure uh, how that all transpired. Uh, NIST NIST is a really really typically uh, an outstanding uh, facility. They provide very good help for all the engineers. For this study, it, it had to be uh, through. I, I just don't know how that how that could have occurred to end up with the uh, inaccuracies in the study. Okay, well, this viewer's uh, driving it home here. I'm sorry, but he says, so do you think that column failures were due to something else besides fire? What might that be? Well, you know, I'm, I've been very careful not to uh, put anything out there. there but for, for sure, those columns uh, had to uh, come out uh, in the manner in which I said they were for this building to come down. And that would have been uh, failure over eight stories and, and the interior columns coming down first uh, first starting with the the, um, the penthouse and then the interior columns and then following that the exterior columns and that was, that was over an eight story and pro probably somewhere anywhere below the 16th floor or uh, would have caused that kind of thing the failures at the penthouse actually were uh, caused near near the top of the building, not within the lower part of the building where there were fires, where that all started. What relevance would that have? Uh, the, the Couldn't failure? have been a fire. Couldn't have been a fire. Ah. Didn't happen. Okay. 
Kelly, you've been with AE911 Truth for how many years now? Seven. What do you think brought those buildings down? Personally, um, I just don't see how it could be anything other than a controlled demolition, in my opinion. Well, Kelly and Larry Landon in our office helped us to make something about both, all three of these towers, which is a series of cards. Uh, and if, if somebody has taken the time to look at this evidence, like we're going to be providing Roland Angle and myself uh, in, in the next segment, actually, um, these cards are very handy. If, if guys at home, if you've looked at the evidence and you're convinced that it was a controlled demolition, then I am personally asking you to do something about it. And I'm going to give you some options. Hand these out at a table on your street and the brochures. These are the 9-11 Truth Good for America brochures with all the evidence and an insert in there and why America needs the 9-11 Truth so much, especially at this time. Um, we're going to give two 100 packs away. So just email me at info at AE. 911truth.org, put your address and put brochure, and I'll send you those. Write card, because we're going to give two 50 packs of each of these cards to you right now. We will mail it as soon as we get your address at info at AE911truth. Just put cards. So, um, and these things are available in our store if you're not the lucky winner of the first two. What, I sound like I'm on TV or something. Anyway, um, we've got more exciting things that are, all these are in a store. But, but we want to, when I give them away, why? Because we're encouraging you to spend your money, not on products right now, but uh, to support the effort of Matt Campbell. Because the evidence that Leroy Halsey has put together in this four-year study is going straight into the UK court system within a month. And we are, uh, we are going to be turning things upside down there because the attorney general has no choice, really, given all the veracity of this evidence. It's irrefutable and overwhelming uh, to uh, appoint a new uh, inquest into Jeff, uh, Jeff Campbell's death, his murder in the North Tower. So um, that's what I wanted to tell you guys. And I have another question for you, Leroy. Uh, so do you think, no, wait, we got that one. Uh, this, this is a former project engineer. And he's wondering if there are any dynamic correlation values that can be used to compare the veracity of your model and simulation versus the NIST model and simulation. Uh, th there probably could be. I don't fully know if I have the answer to that question at this moment. Uh, I'd have to think about it. Uh, in order to get that correlation, we would have to see uh, the model results of their of their system, uh, of their their finite element model. Then we could correlate for sure. So, okay. Well, here's another one for you. <laughs> It doesn't end. We've just got all kinds of goodies for you. How do you reconcile these three events? One, the seismic activity occurring at building seven, 10 seconds prior to its overall collapse. Two, the collapse of the penthouse a few seconds prior to the overall collapse. And three, the overall collapse itself. For the penthouse to collapse, wouldn't that be evidence of major internal destruction, which had yet to cause deformations in the exterior of the building? Okay, so to, to the answer to the question about seismic, um, we, we looked in that and did not see any evidence that seismic was a 
was a problem for here for the bridge or building. In terms of the penthouse, we looked at that significant amount of time and and explored uh, what it would take for that penthouse to come down the way it did. And uh, basically, we determined that uh, that failure was at a high level. Of and we and we look, examined more than one level to see if that was uh, truly occurring, uh, which means that that uh, that column those columns failed at that at that level significantly at that point, and then that of course uh, was followed up by the interior all the interior columns at over an eight story area uh, that were. That were severed and and came and that led to uh, 1.3 seconds later the exterior columns uh, having the same experience. So basically, that's the way it worked okay. to get what you saw out there. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you all. This has been an enlightening discussion for me. Anybody have any final thoughts before we uh, uh, end the segment? No. I got I got nothing. <laughs> you let guys me say one, awesome. Go ahead. Let please. me just say one thing. As a as a researcher, I appreciate the opportunity to have been given uh, the funding to be able to support two PhD students, and they did graduate, uh, and uh, and and doing well. And I thank you all for giving us the university that opportunity. Well, thank you, Leroy. Thank you, Leroy, so much, and thank you, Kelly, and thank you, Dylan, and we'll catch up with all you guys real soon. <laughs>